Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. What does it mean to age gracefully? Maybe it's about finding the hobby that gives you euphoria. It's such a liberating feeling. I get up on my blades and I just feel like I can fly. Or maybe it's about moving and grooving to the beat. I love, love, love line dancing. Even after a hip replacement, I still love to dance. Perhaps Joel has the secret. I started going on canoe trips down some of the Western rivers with some old friends that were of the same mind. And for sure, Orvi has an idea. As you try things that work for you, you find out, hey, I can do that after all. And it's very individual for people in pain. All of these people have one thing in common. They're living proof of aging gracefully. Welcome to Thriving While Aching, a podcast that inspires and teaches you how to live a fuller life while safely managing pain. I'm Dr. Laurie Ferguson, Director of Education at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. Have you ever noticed that you feel better when you help someone else? For Orvi, helping others find their true purpose in life and adapt to new situations makes what she gives away come back to her. It's lovely to meet you. Thanks for coming on to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. The podcast is called Thriving While Aching. And I'm just curious to know, when I say thriving, how does that look in your life? What's thriving? I think thriving is really having a quality of life and being able to do some of the things that I really want to do and finding ways to do that, even if it means adapting some things. What I really like to do is I like to play a lot. I work certainly, but I do like to play with my daughter and granddaughter. What has helped you to thrive? I'm a trainer and a leader for the self-management programs that were developed at Stanford University. And that's really part of my thriving, to find people that are just kind of stuck and they're not sure what they need to do next. And from my experiences, from the programs, from working with a co-leader, you can help those people have some aha moments so they can figure out some things they can do at their own level. And they too, hopefully, can start thriving and feeling better and have a quality of life they'd like to have. It's easy to think a trainer or a teacher has it all figured out, but Orvi is still figuring out ways to adapt in her own life. I have pain every day. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I have pain throughout my body. I am better controlled than I was when I was first diagnosed, but I use a lot of tools and tips that I got in the program. For one thing, I realized that I needed to lose some weight. And so I started paying a little more attention to healthier eating and started walking. I have a lot of numbness in my feet or not so much numbness, but tingling, which they think is part of the arthritis. It's there all the time, but I have found if I put on a certain sock and a certain shoe, I can go walk and I don't notice it's there as much. So I found even through the programs, distraction will help me. It's hard to focus on the pain if I'm doing something else. For people who live with conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, physical activity is an important way to help manage the disease. My name is Kathleen Cameron, and my title is Senior Director for the Center for Healthy Aging at the National Council on Aging. Kathleen explains that for patients like Orvi, being physically active is also key to managing their arthritis pain. The CDC recommends physical activity such as walking, bicycling, and swimming because it decreases arthritis pain and improves function, mood, and quality of life. And they recommend that adults with arthritis should move more and sit less throughout the day. And getting at least 150 minutes of moderate intensive physical activity each week is what they recommend. Orvi, if I'm in pain, it's really hard for me to put on a sock and put on a shoe and get out the door. So how do you motivate yourself to do that when you're in pain? Well, it started small. And part of that is when I was in the worst part of the rheumatoid, 
I had a lot of inflammation swelling. And so movement wasn't easy. So I worked with my healthcare team. I did go for some therapeutic intervention because I was to the point that I was going to probably be in a wheelchair if I didn't change something. So for me, biologics helped to get me on that path. Then once I was able to move a little more, I always start out thinking that one thing I think that happens in life is when we set a lot of times with pain, we don't hurt as much, but all of us have to get up and go to the bathroom. So I would notice I'd have to walk a distance and my stiffness would get better the longer I went. So I started seeing how the pattern went. And what I did is I would start out small and walking. And as I did that more and more, I was able to go further and further. Taking those first steps certainly wasn't easy for Orvi, but getting up and walking was a small yet important part in her weight loss journey. Between that and healthy eating, I lost almost 60 pounds, which helped. And so I think putting all those things together and as you try things that work for you, you find out, hey, I can do that after all. And it's very individual for people in pain. And I find with pain, it's hard for us to focus on two things at once as human beings. We don't do that well. And so if you set and just live with the pain and let it just rule you versus trying some type of distraction. It could be a small distraction, whether it's watching a movie or if you recite a poem. If you do things like that, you notice that that pain is no longer front and center. And so I think it's a learning curve for all of us. Then when we're trying to make changes in our life is just kind of pay attention to what works for us, capitalize on it, and then continue in that pattern. And those lifestyle changes for Orvi have made a huge improvement in her quality of life. I think after you set so long with pain, it becomes rather boring. And to me, it was frustrating because I thought, I don't want to set and watch life go by. I want to become part of life. Part of my motivation was I had a little granddaughter. Um, She was two when I was first diagnosed. And that was part of my motivation. My daughter and I, best friends. And so we had always done things together. So that was motivation too. I wanted to continue that fun, that sense of belonging. And then my husband will travel when he can, when he's not working. But I just wanted to be able to participate in life and not sit and watch everybody else do life. It sounds like you're really engaging in all your relationships. What about setting goals? Where do you start? I think the key is you start where you're at as an individual. You take small steps and don't overwhelm yourself. There's a Mary Englebright card that I really like, and it says, don't look back and you come to a crossroads. And one says your life, the other says no longer an option. I keep that out in front of me because I'm going on with my life. I'm not going to think about what I did 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the programs were very beneficial because they all have action planning. It feels like when you see success, the momentum just builds and builds, but you also rewarded yourself with something you love, a jacuzzi. Yes, I love a good jacuzzi. (laughs) Oh yeah. Adding something healthy that also makes you feel good must have been a positive reinforcement. Exactly, and I think that's really key because if we enjoy doing something, if we're trying to build a health behavior, we're more apt to stay with it than if we say, oh, I'm going to do this. Well, that's not positive self-talk. You know, we can talk to ourselves either in a positive manner or a negative manner. And so I don't want to be the negative one to say, oh, I think I'll take a walk today. I want to be enthused about it and say, you know, I want to get out there and walk today because it'll give me an opportunity that I can get out. Maybe I'll listen to a podcast while I'm walking, various things like that. And it doesn't have to be long. I don't want people to think, well, I'm not at that level. 
I get it. We all have to start somewhere to get to a point that we're better, you know, and some of our programs we call getting back to better. And I think that's the goal. We all want to get back to better. And so if we can do certain things that give us pleasure, we're more apt to continue it and then have more of a quality of life we want. Orvi, when you received your diagnosis, did you find there were things you couldn't get back to doing? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's things I can't do. I can't ride a bicycle anymore. That's not going to happen. There's just different things that as far as physical activity, I might have done. I can't really power walk anymore, but I can walk. I can walk certain distances. I learn when I need to stop. And that takes, you know, a little education on yourself of listening to your body and knowing when too much is too much. I do some things setting down more than I used to. I used to be able to stand all day long, but sometimes I can't do that because of the limitations I have with arthritis. So I think I just have looked at it as life changes. And so sometimes it's nice to enlist other people to help you if you need things. I can't climb up on a ladder and change a light bulb anymore or even a step stool. So I have to find ways that I can get someone else to do it for me. But it's kind of like, okay, that's kind of a rite of passage. I'm aging and I've got arthritis. So be it. And you've been fortunate to find a change of venue to help. My daughter happens to live in California now. So uh, I like to go out there and walks on the beach. We recently did Sandcastle Building, which in the Midwest, we don't have a place to do that. So I found ways to do other things that I might have done more physical things before, but I've adapted. So I might take a cooking class or I might just adapt so that I can get out, but I might not walk two or three miles. I might just go a half a mile instead of a while or not even that much. Just find ways to do what I want to do, but modify it if I need a bench, if I need to stop and rest. Say, okay, that's fine. I'm not 19 anymore. Adaptation is the key, especially for things we love doing in our 30s that we struggle with as we age. Kathleen points out it's important for patients managing pain to discover new ways to find enjoyment. I really love what Orvi has discovered, and that is paying attention to what works, capitalizing on it, and then continuing in that pattern, but also understanding that it may change. And one good idea that many doctors, nurse practitioners, and others recommend is to create a diary of daily activities and include what works for pain management. And in this diary, you should write down what medications have been taken both prescription and over-the-counter medications, how much have been taken, how they control your pain, and then also list the other types of things that you may have done to manage your pain during the day. Things like exercise that we've talked about, maybe mindfulness meditation, and some of the exercise programs that we've mentioned. Also include what may have aggravated the pain during the day. This is really important to share with your healthcare providers, and that's going to help ensure that the treatment plan that is being developed or tweaked over time is right for you. The more information you can share with your healthcare providers, the better. Orvi, your attitude is so inspiring. It feels like you stay very connected to your motivation, whether it's pushing through the pain or accepting that it's just part of life now. I think it's probably a little of all of that, but especially if I'm distracted, I don't realize where it hurts. If I'm alone and walking somewhere and then I feel a hurt, I'm going, I forgot that was there because I had been distracted in a conversation or doing something else. I think another thing is to find maybe a circle of people that you can really connect with and I've certainly done that. We kind of have a little coffee group. There's four of us women that will try to get together once in a while. And we all have plenty of aches and pains and chronic conditions between us. But when we meet, 
We don't talk about that. We distract ourselves and we've managed to do it during COVID. We were getting together about once a week, but we do it outside and we measured our distance, you know, and so we've been very safe. But I think that connectivity helps with isolation for people because we certainly had a lot of people socially isolated. And then what we did too with the programs is we were able to convert them to virtual programming. And we now offer toolkits for those programs for people who are not internet connected or computer savvy. All you need is a telephone and we meet once a week as a leader meets with them. Those are rewarding things, I think, that help people stay socially connected. That's another aspect of quality of life because you've got someone else that you can talk to and be there for you. Orvi, I'm so grateful to have spent this time with you and to be inspired by your liveliness. You are indeed helping other people light candles. So thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. When you're trying to change and manage your pain, the important thing to remember is that you need to go one step at a time. That's how Orvi managed to overcome her pain from arthritis. Because whether setting foot on the moon or climbing a mountain, it requires small steps. To learn more about the programs that Orvi mentioned, you can check out the resources we've included on the Thriving While Aching podcast page. We hope you found this episode and our series inspiring. We'd love to know how you are thriving while aching. Send us an email, a short video, or audio clip. Tell us your secret to aging gracefully so we can share it with others in our community. Send it to thriving at ghlf.org. Thanks for joining us for Thriving While Aching, a podcast that inspires and teaches you how to live a fuller life while safely managing pain. If you liked this episode, give us a five-star rating and write a positive review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help more people like you find us. I'm Dr. Laurie Ferguson. Take care. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. This podcast is made possible with support from Johnson & Johnson Consumer Health, sponsor of the Global Healthy Living Foundation.